I'm Michael Panino. Um, I'm an ecologist at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about trends in drinking water nitrate. So my talk today is explaining trends in drinking water nitrate. Um, I'd like to uh, list the, my collaborators for my research at the US EPA, and they're Scott Leibowitz, Jenna Compton, Robert Sabo, Ryan Hill, Steve Leduc, and Luce Bayani. Um, I need to mention that any opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the US Environmental Protection Agency. So here's a brief outline. Uh, first, I'm gonna give you a little bit more about my background. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, five different projects I've been working on at the EPA. Uh, one is on uh, drinking water nitrate spatial and temporal trends. The other is on uh, predicting risk for nitrate in drinking water. The third is explaining the causes for nitrate temp temporal trends. The fourth is looking at the impacts of wildfires on drinking water nitrate. And the last one um, is a project I'm starting trying to predict future risk for nitrate in drinking water. <clears throat> So a little bit about my background. Um, I got my bachelor's from the Oberlin College in Ohio. I got my PhD from the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, where I looked at the impacts of urban land use on water quality and carbon and nitrogen source tracking. Um, then I did a postdoc at Princeton University, looking at stormwater green infrastructure. And then for the last five years, I've been working at the EPA, looking at drinking water contamination trends and risk assessment. So uh, for my talk, a little bit of background about uh, nitrogen. Um, so here's some spatial patterns for nitrogen inputs. Um, and this, um, these figures come from a colleague of mine at the EPA, Robert Sabo, um, a study he did in biogeosciences. Um, he found that if you look at total nitrogen inputs, um, the, the, the largest inputs are in the darker red color. And to be uh, mostly in the upper Midwest, there's also some in the Central Valley of California here. Um, and if you look on the figure on the, the right, you can look at the different types of uh, different sources of nitrogen inputs. So in yellow, we have agricultural fertilizer, um, which you also find in the, uh, the Midwest area. You also have a lot of nitrogen, total nitrogen deposition, that's the primary source in, in some areas in the Northeast. If you have nit natural nitrogen fixation is the dominant source in, in the Southeast. <clears throat> Um, we also have found that nitrogen inputs have increased nationally uh, um, over, the, over the last uh, century. And uh, one of the dominant sources, again, is, is fertilizer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this increase in nitrogen inputs has led to a, a variety of negative environmental impacts, um, such as the excess nitrogen making its way to coastal water bodies, um, like the Gulf of Mexico and the Chesapeake Bay, which is a, this displayed here in this figure on the right. Um, and you often can get eutrophication and hypoxia or, or dead zones uh, in areas where you have lots of nitrogen uh, occurring. Um, and so it's, a, a, it's a bad for the, the fish species and, and other aquatic organisms in the area. <clears throat> um, nitrate is also an issue if you have lots of nitrate in drinking water, it can have serious health effects. It's been known for a while that um, excess nitrate um, can cause a blue baby syndrome for, for infants. Uh, and more recently, we found that excess nitrate is associated with certain thyroid issues, cancers, and birth defects. <clears throat> so um, for my research, I've been focusing on public drinking water supplies. So I wanna give you a little bit of, of background uh, on, on public water systems. So in general, um, our public water, um, which serves about 85% of the US population, the other 15% is on private, usually on private uh, drinking water wells. Um, but again, this data set that I'm working on for my analyses are on, on the public drinking water supplies. And often they come from a water source such as surface water or groundwater, and they go through a treatment plant um, before they are distributed to homes or, or businesses. And they're usually uh, quarterly uh, or more often samplings taken at the treatment plant to make sure that the water does not contain any contaminants. Um, and the, the EPA has set um, certain um, maximum contaminant levels, MCLs, um, 
for certain contaminants, and one of them is, is nitrate. And if nitrate exceeds 10 milligrams per liter, it is considered to be in violation. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of information is has been collected for the past few decades, um, since the 90s, by the EPA Safe Drinking Water Information System. That's the where I've been collecting a lot of my drinking water nitrate data. <clears throat> So for my first uh, project, the, the research questions were to find out how have the number of nitrate violations changed over time? And then also how do nitrate violations vary geographically? Um, so some overall patterns we found uh, for nitrate violations. Um, on the figure on the left, we find that most of um, the violations are coming from groundwater systems, um, about 95% of all nitrate violations on groundwater systems. Um, but we find that on the figure on the right, that the amount of, that more people are served by, that more people get their water from a surface water system. And so there's um, about 63% uh, of the people getting their water comes from surface water systems that are in violation for nitrate. <clears throat> um, and if you look at the patterns for nitrate violations, from both groundwater and surface water systems together, you can see there was uh, an increasing trend from 1994 through uh, about 2009. And there has been a, a decreasing trend from 2009 to 2016. But we find based on this, these different uh, colors that most of the, the violations for nitrate were coming from these very small systems, less than 500 people served um, or from you know, small and medium systems so mo most uh, violations per in these smaller systems. If you look at the, the temporal trends for groundwater and surface water systems separately, you find that um, surface water systems in blue have actually been declining since the late 90s, relatively steady um, since uh, about 2010. Whereas groundwater systems, they were increasing from the mid nineties to about 2009, and they've been, they've been declining since about 2010. Um, we can also look at the temporal trends for the number of people impacted or number of people served by a drinking water system that is in violation for nitrate. Um, so if you look, we'll find that there were over time, in certain years where there was a kind of a spike in, in the number of people. So there's over a million people being served by uh, systems that were either surface water in blue or groundwater in red that were in violation for nitrate. I looked more closely, I found that these spikes, particularly the, the ones coming from blue in blue, the surface water systems were actually from one system um, in Columbus, Ohio, that was having a persistent nitrate issue. Um, <clears throat> and there was one system in Long Island, New York that was causing um, the, uh, that had, that served a, a large number of people, um, in 2002. So, but since then the, this Ohio system has improved its treatment. And so they're, they're no longer having violations. Um, and, but if you remove those spikes, you see that in general, that the number of people served by systems in violation has had a, a somewhat, uh, of a decreasing trend over time, which is a good sign. <clears throat> Um, and so I've also looked at the spatial patterns, uh, like the county level patterns for nitrate violations. And the figure on the left is looking at the mean annual number of systems in violation per county. The figure on the right is looking at the mean annual population served by a system in violation for nitrate. Um, so in general, you, you find that there's, some, there's a county like in the Central Valley of California that has had a higher number of violations. Um, you also have other regions, there's some, uh, Southeastern Pennsylvania and Delaware and other regions that have had higher number of violations. Um, and you can see that in red, there's a, a, a county in, in Columbus, Ohio, which was serving a lot, large number of people. <clears throat> so the conclusions for this, this first study was that most violations we found are in small non-community groundwater systems, but one surface water system in violation can potentially impact millions of people. This work um, can help inform management decisions aimed at minimizing public health, health risk um, by learning more about what's going on with the treatment versus what's going on with the source water. 
<clears throat> so for the second study, um, I was looking at what locations are most at risk for having nitrate in public drinking water systems and what factors explain the spatial patterns in drinking water nitrate violations. And for that study, I did some predictive modeling. And so basically I was looking at where we knew that we've had violations. Those are these red dots where we've had groundwater nitrate violations on the left. And on the right are the, the red dots represent the locations where we've had surface water nitrate violations. And these blue um, uh, locations are where, we've, where we have public water systems for groundwater. And so we haven't yet had violations where there's just blue, but I'm trying to predict, I, I've made a predictive model to, to figure out if any of these locations that have not yet had a violation, do they have a higher risk for a potential future violation for, for nitrate and drinking water? <clears throat> so based on some predictive modeling use, using a variety of, of um, predictor variables, variables such as uh, climate variables like precipitation, temperature, um, nitrogen uh, input variables, uh, land use variables, and so on, I was able to make a predictive model to make this map to show the areas in red are where you have a higher probability or a higher risk for having a nitrate violation. So this figure, this map of the United States on the left is for groundwater nitrate. And see, so we found that like in the Central Valley of California, there's has a high risk for nitrate, your public drinking water supplies to be in violation for for nitrate. And then also we find um, the central United States and we found that there's, there's the Ogallala Aquifer kind of in this um, Texas uh, up through Nebraska area um, where they have a lot of groundwater nitrate um, violations there. And so there's high, high risk for other regions in that area as well. You also find high risk in the Delaware, and south, southeastern Pennsylvania. And the, the map for on the right for surface water nitrate is similar to the groundwater, but you find that more, there's more risk in the southwestern United States, more risk in Arizona and Southern uh, California, and also southern, Southwestern uh, Texas. <clears throat> um, and with that modeling, I was also able to find what are the dominant drivers for, for nitrate in drinking water. We found for, uh, for groundwater sourced uh, drinking water, we find that percent cropland, um, things like um, drainage, ag agricultural drainage, uh, surplus excess nitrate. Um, we also have surplus precipitation, those kinds of variables, um, which were you know, yellow are land use, red are nitrogen input variables, and blue are like climatic hydrologic variables. So those are the main drivers for the, for the groundwater nitrate. And there for surface water nitrate, we find that there's even more uh, in blue, more climatic hydrologic variables like surplus precipitation, that's um, precipitation minus evapotranspiration. Um, so when you have excess precipitation, you're more likely to have surface, uh, surface water violations we found. Actually, there's a negative relationship the, so that actually when you have excess precipitation, you're less likely to have surface water uh, violations. So when you're in more arid climates, we found a higher probability of, of there being um, surface water nitrate violations. <clears throat> and so um, here's a couple of the, the specific relationships between um, certain of some of those predictor variables and whether or not you have a risk for a violation. Um, we found that when you look at certain variables that have a, an inflection point that might be useful for managers. For example, um, this is excess surplus nitrogen inputs and you find if you get above maybe about 10,000 10, kilograms of nitrogen um, that you're adding to the landscape, then you're gonna have a much higher, a, a, a more rapid increase in the risk for violations. So when you're below a certain amount of excess nitrogen, then you're at less risk when you're below 10,000 kilograms. Similarly to the, that surplus precipitation I mentioned earlier that when you're in, um, when you have a negative surplus precipitation, more arid climates, you're at higher risk. Um, of, uh, of having nitrate violations. But there are other um, variables that don't have as much of, a, of an inflection point as, so there's more of a gradual increase for percent cropland, for example. But again, th this kind of information can help managers know um, how to potentially uh, impact 
um, the kinds of inputs and, and what they're doing and how much precipitation, how much irrigation they're doing in the landscape is are important um, information to help managers know how to, to reduce nitrogen loss to the landscape. So again, some of the conclusions from this analysis were the results show that the, the locations and factors that are associated with higher risk for drinking water nitrate violations and this knowledge on the factors that influence nitrate violations, such as nitrogen surplus, this irrigation to precipitation ratio, crop percent cropland and things like that, those can help managers better address drinking water issues. And also uh, public water systems, um, cha changes uh, in those systems, potentially use of treatment is also likely important for reducing risk in drinking water nitrate. So that wasn't concluded from this analysis, but my next analysis is, is trying to look at, um, at that last point. Um, so we're trying to look at what factors explain these temporal trends in drinking water nitrate violations. So for this, I'm showing some um, unpublished uh, preliminary results. Um, so I'm trying to look more closely at, um, as I pointed out before, that there was more recently been a decline in groundwater nitrate violations. Um, and there's also has been a decline in surface water nitrate violations. And I'm trying to figure out, is this change over time due to changes in nitrogen inputs over time, or could it be more due to a system using treatment or maybe they're doing other things like switching to new sources? Is that helping reduce the amount of nitrate violations? And it could also be what's going on in the source water and in, in the, the upstream watersheds and source water protection measures. Um, so for this analysis, I'm looking at the counties where they had violations and I've looked at whether there was a, a decrease in green in either surface water or groundwater violations over time, or there's been an increase in red in, in time, over time. So as you can see, some counties like in Ohio, where there, there's been a decrease in surface water nitrate violations, but in, in California, there's been an increase in surface water nitrate violations. And then I'm combining that with information on nitrogen input trends. So whether this surplus nitrogen has increased or decreased over time. And so from this map, you can see that, for example, in Iowa and Illinois and Indiana, there's been a lot, lot most of the counties there have increased in their um, in nitrogen inputs um, over time, 2002 through 2012. When I combine the input information together with the end violation information and uh, look at um, whether there's a positive match in red, they both, both inputs and violations have increased. There's a negative match in green where both inputs and violations have decreased. And I have in yellow, I call some, something I call legacy where you've had the inputs have decreased, but your violations are still increasing. So they're, it's called legacy in, the, in that, that your violations are still increasing over time. So it must be still some leftover nitrogen from previous inputs that um, are causing a, still a rise in violations. And the opposite of that is where the, your nitrogen inputs may still be increasing over time, but your violations have decreased. And maybe, that, and I'm calling that retention in blue, and that might mean that something's going on at the actual system level, that they're using better treatment or they've switched to new sources. And <clears throat> So, uh, so some of, the, of these results we found so far, um, there are some counties where, um, where we have a, this negative match. They're both the inputs, like in Ohio, we have inputs of nitrogen and the violations have both decreased. Um, and in California for surface water, we found that we have yellow. So that means the inputs have um, decreased, but the, the violations are still increasing. So we can see you can look at these maps and, see, and try to figure out, you know, what percentage of all these counties are increasing or decreasing. We found so that we have like about 68% uh, where there's a, a either red or green that they're they're all matched, either increasing, both increasing or both decreasing. For surface water, is 44% for groundwater. So in general, the takeaway from this is that um, that the changes in nitrogen inputs doesn't tell the whole story, and that the fact that there is a percentage of retention going on, there's some sites in blue, that it means that there could be the treatment and blending could also be contributing to why there are um, decreases in nitrate violations over time. So to look at that a little bit 
more deeply, I've um, went to specific systems and here's Ohio as an example um, and try to figure out what is going on at the system. Did they actually change sources? Did they have improved treatment? Um, so these symbols represent, um, you know, they, did they deactivate a, a system? Is a, a, a triangle, an upside down triangle is treatment. Um, and then the colored circles are in green is it, was there a decrease in violation in that location or was there an increase in violation? So we find, and then this plus symbol is where there were no changes were made. And so the, there's a couple of sites, no changes made. And there was a, there was an increase in violations. Um, there was a site that where there was treatment used and there was a decrease in violation. Um, so, but this, the story isn't always consistent, but um, the, again, this is preliminary results and trying to figure out if, if this can help explain some of the story. Um, so some conclusions from this analysis is that we found that changes in nitrogen inputs and the, what's going on with the public water system operation both seem to play a role in shaping the trends in the drinking water nitrate. But again, there's further work needs to be done there. Um, I also need to assess the role of source water protection. Um, and I'm also gonna be looking at um, state and regional patterns more closely. Um, so my, for my fourth project, I was looking at whether drinking water um, impacts uh, nitrate, I mean, whether wildfires impact nitrate in drinking water. So the hypothesis here is that um, it's known that wildfires, you know, they, they can ravage a landscape and, you know, they kill the, the, a lot of the vegetation, they burn and combust the vegetation, um, and that can lead to increased mineralization, um, the breakdown and, of, and release of potential nitrogen in, into the soils. Um, can increase nitrification and, and also there's going to be a decreased demand for nitrogen because there's no more pl living plants there. And so that can re lead to nitrogen running off from wildfire impacted um, watersheds. And then also you have uh, when there's fire suppressants used, that's usually composed of ammonium phosphate. So that could also be another source of nitrate as well as phosphorus um, to source waters. Um, so for this analysis, I was looking at the locations of, um, <clears throat> of where there have been wildfires um, from 1984 to 2016. So the, these gray um, the locations are where we've had wildfires. So they're not just in the, in the Western United States, there are some in, in the, the East and Southeast. So these are not just forest fires, they're also, it could be grassland fires as well, included in this analysis. Um, and so what I found is if you look at the figure on the left is for surface water nitrate, and these are the y-axis is for concentration. And in each of these individual um, panels, we have a control on the left and the wildfire results on the right. Um, essentially, um, I'm looking at the, what ha so I looked at post-wildfire nitrate violations compared, or nitrate concentrations in drinking water compared with pre-wildfire uh, nitrate concentrations in drinking water. We found that there was, when you look at the difference that there is a positive, um, you know, there's still a variable, but there was an increase in nitrate concentrations post wildfire in, the, in one year after wildfire and also three years after wildfire. <clears throat> where, whereas if you go out to 10 years after wildfire, there isn't any change. There wasn't any change in your control. The control sites were sites that um, did not have any wildfire events. Um, but I looked at groundwater and you couldn't you couldn't find a, a difference that even though in after 10 years for groundwater nitrate, um, there was an increase, but the control also showed an increase. So you couldn't make a strong conclusion that um, the wildfires caused an increase in, in groundwater violations. <clears throat> but you could look at, um, and that was, again, the, the previous slide was just the average or overall trends on average. But I also looked at what's going on at individual uh, sites. And we found that the, the sprinkling of different uh, blue, green, and red dots are showing that in red, um, those are sites that increased in nitrate uh, after wildfire. The sites in, in green decreased in nitrate after wildfire and the sites in blue didn't have any change when you compared pre versus post wildfire. So there, are, there isn't really any strong patterns where there's sites with more red than blue or green. What you can take away from this is that there are still, um, even though there might not be overall patterns for groundwater, as I showed in the, in the last slide, there are still certain locations that 
showed an increase post wildfire that were impacted by wildfires you know, at, the, at the individual site level. Um, and when you look at, you compare the, oh, all the violations um, overall, you find that 30% of all surface water nitrate violations were, have been associated with wildfires and 13% of groundwater nitrate violations are associated with wildfires. <clears throat> so the conclusions from this study were that on average wildfires are associated with an increase in surface water nitrate. This elevated nitrate can last multiple years post wildfire. Um, and this research may help prepare vulnerable water systems for wildfires and their impacts. Um, and this last project, uh, number five, that, I, that I'm just in the beginning stages of, is uh, to look at how locations of high risk for nitrate water, how locations, um, how will locations of high risk for nitrate, drinking water nitrate violations change in the future with a changing climate or changing land use or changing end inputs. So essentially I'm trying to find out um, if in the future, if we look at how climate might change or how end inputs might change in the future, will the, right, the locations that I predicted for high risk for nitrate violations, will that change? You know, will the red areas shift at all in 10 or 50 years from now? <clears throat> so uh, finally, I wanna get, just gonna give some overall uh, conclusions or implications for this, this study. Um, we found that uh, this research highlights areas that to prioritize management of source water quality for drinking water systems and where systems may need better treatment. Um, public water systems that may need that we may need to prioritize include large surface water systems that serve hundreds or, or of thousands to millions of people, and also public water systems with persistent nitrate problems. Um, they may need treatment upgrades or other remediation, and public water systems in more arid climates or areas of high nitrogen surplus or wildfire prone regions, those might be systems that we might wanna to prioritize to make sure that they don't continue to have nitrate violations. And also wanna point out that the EPA has taken action to reduce risk through supporting reductions in nutrient loads from point and non-point sources. Um, they've been strengthening nutrient standards and they provided financial assistance to, financial assistance to communities for drinking water treatment. Um, so just have a slide with showing some of the references I, um, from these analyses. Um, and I have a, just an acknowledgement for all the, the folks at the EPA who've helped with my data analysis or helping me gather the data or looking over, over these, these studies. Um, so I wanna thank you for this opportunity to uh, tell you about um, my nitrate and drinking water research. Thank you. <laughs>